When you read the Bible really closely, with an awareness of the preconceived ideas you are bringing to the table, you start to see some things that are otherwise easy to miss. Many modern Bible readers, for example, have grown up with the tradition that Moses wrote the first five books of the Hebrew Bible. So when you read, maybe you miss some of the stuff in the text that has led many scholars to call Mosaic authorship into question. Some of this stuff is silly, like, if Moses wrote the Pentateuch, why does he write about himself in the third person and not the first person? Instead of saying, I did this or I said that, it's Moses did this and Moses said that. Also, how bold would you have to be to write of yourself? Now Moses was a very humble man, more humble than anyone else on the face of the earth. I mean, it's hilarious if he did, but it's weird. And speaking of weird, at the end of Deuteronomy, the author writes, and Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in Moab. Scholars went beyond the surfacey stuff too. They highlighted texts like Genesis 12, 6, which makes an offhanded comment about a story taking place at the time when Canaanites were in the land. For this editorial comment to make any sense, the author would have to be writing at a time when the Canaanites were not in the land. The author is calling the audience to remember way back when, when the Canaanites were still there. And in so doing, he's presuming that the current day is well past the days of Abraham and Moses. Scholars also noticed some anachronisms in the text. An anachronism is something that doesn't fit the context, like a picture of Abe Lincoln with a cell phone. Genesis says that Abraham was a camel herder it doesn't fit the data. Camels aren't known to be domesticated animals until much later. Abe riding a camel and Abe calling his VP on an iPhone. Neither one makes sense. When people began reading the Bible this closely, they began to notice other oddities too, like how the divine name is used and why certain stories seem to be repeated, both of which led to the groundbreaking proposal that the first five books of the Bible were not written by Moses, but rather that they were made up of different sources stitched together by an editor to create what we have now. Let's look at the parade example of the theory, the flood story in Genesis six through eight. Most of us are already familiar with the main contours of the story, but if you read it really closely, it'll bring up some interpretive issues. In Genesis 7, 2 through 3, the text says that Noah should bring seven pairs of clean animals, a single pair of unclean animals, and seven pairs of birds into the ark. Then a few verses later, it says that Noah should take one pair of the following into the ark, clean animals, unclean animals, birds, and things that creep on the ground. So which is it, seven pairs or one? Likewise, in Genesis 7:12, it says that it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. But in verse 24, it says that the waters grew strong for 150 days. Now, maybe that means something like it rained for a bit and then the water hung around for a while. But in Genesis 8:6, it says that Noah started sending out birds at the end of 40 days. According to this timeline, the event is pretty short. But in the other timeline, Noah and his family and the animals are in the boat for at least a year. Added to these apparent discrepancies, the use of the divine name alternates back and forth. God is referred to as Elohim sometimes and Yahweh at other times. All of these oddities led scholars, most famously Julius Wellhausen, to hypothesize the potential isolation of different sources in the flood account. One source they named J which is an abbreviation of the German spelling for Yahweh, and the other they named P, which is an abbreviation for a priestly source. The priestly source usually uses the word Elohim for the divine. Here's where it gets really cool. When you identify and divide these two sources, they read like continuous and relatively independent narratives. It's pretty impressive, and it alleviates the tension in the text. 
Richard Friedman says these narratives use their own language. They include their own details, and they describe their own depictions of God. Another prime example is the creation stories in Genesis 1 and 2. Again, we've been trained to read them in a certain way. But when you look at them closely, you'll start to see some big differences. In Genesis 1, the account is highly structured. It's almost rhythmic, poetic even. And God is above it all, speaking things into existence with the climax of creation being humanity on day six and of the account itself kingly rest on day seven. Further, God is referred to throughout as Elohim. In Genesis 2, the depiction of God is really different. God is an artist. He's forming humanity from the dust of the earth and breathing breath into its nostrils. God is walking around the garden in the cool of the day, having conversations with the human. God is not above it all, speaking things into existence. No, God is participating in it. And God, throughout the narrative, is referred to as Yahweh. Also, check this out. In a good translation of Genesis 2, the order of creation is different. In Genesis 1, God creates everything and then caps it off with humanity. In Genesis 2, God creates man. Then God creates a garden for him to work in. Then God sees that it's not good for man to be alone, so God creates the animals. A lot of English translations bury this by saying, now God had created the animals. It's called a pluperfect, and it's unnecessary. The only reason they word it this way is to make Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 agree. A much better translation reflects this order. God creates man, then animals, and when God realizes this won't help the companionship piece of humanity, then God creates woman. It's crazy, right? These sorts of conclusions led scholars to go back and reread the Pentateuch with an eye toward identifying potential sources. The majority have concluded that there are four. J, which is known as the Yahwist, E, which is an abbreviation for another name of God, Elohim, so it's the Elohist source, D for the author of Deuteronomy, which is known as the Deuteronomist, and P, the priestly source. Not everyone agrees on the details of this theory, which is known as the documentary hypothesis, or that it even exists, but it's fair to say that it's accepted in most academic settings. At the very least, a close reading of the Bible brings up questions, and we shouldn't be afraid of them. In fact, they can often lead to a newfound love and admiration for our sacred text. It's beautifully complex, and it's rich in intent. If you want to read through the different versions of the flood story, check the link below. If you have questions or comments, post them. <laughs>